bom dia, bonjour, svanor, Eidala da Mubarak, for all of you that are celebrating. Uh, I will be speaking in English, but I would like just to start by saying some words in Portuguese, if you don't mind, because I'm I'm really happy to be in one of these programs where I can see more uh, Lusophone speaking. Uh, so, uh, Director uh, Daniel uh, Hampton and uh, several other friends that I've met here in the past. It's a great pleasure for me to be here again, once again, especially to celebrate 25 years of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. It's a great pleasure to once again see the many who have worked and dedicated themselves to studying important themes and to Don't worry, I'll go back to English. I, I didn't want to raise issues for all of you here in the classroom. Uh, but um, every time I have the opportunity to speak in Portuguese, it's really nice because uh, um, as, uh, uh, as you know, uh, not that many uh, African countries do speak Portuguese. Uh, although with Angola and Mozambique, uh, there's a couple of millions. Uh, we're a much smaller country. So um, I'm really happy I get to speak after uh, what we heard uh, right now because uh, it was not only a very insightful uh, speech, but it also touched and set the ground for some of my own reflections. Um, as a, a former alumni that benefited from our senior leaders program, but that also had the opportunity to uh, to participate in different other programs um, that touched uh, rule of law, the relations between civil and a military sector. Uh, I'm particularly happy that I have the opportunity to, to speak to you. Uh, it's probably one of the most interesting programs that I've seen uh, throughout my last years and my experience. And uh, the first topic uh, I was asked to, to speak about was what I have learned on how to make effective policy as a strategic leader. Well, uh, it is the $1 million question, as they would say here in the United States, right? Uh, and I chose to bring... Um, five gen generic ideas that I think several of you will be discussing over the next two weeks. Uh, the first one, and also uh, addressed by the first keynote speech, is you should look at the big picture and avoid one-way solutions. When you consider security dimensions, you need to look to holistic and simultaneous and alternative approaches. There's no other way. Uh, it is a complex uh, discussion of uh, the hen and the egg on security and development. But I think it's clear for all of you being at this stage of your uh, careers that security is, is at the core of development but it's rather the latter development that is the real purpose that we should serve. We must understand our place as uh, key role strategic leaders in the security sector and understand the place we hold in the whole picture I was talking about. Security matters demand leadership, of course. But leadership also implies understanding that sometimes we don't have to be in the first in the first role. In the first leadership also means understanding when sometimes other key 
stakeholders, partners, entities need to take on some strategic uh, 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 mandates that would serve security purposes. Uh, and I have two examples, one very close to my, my heart because it's from my country, which is uh, our own national plan that we call the National Plan for Internal Security and Citizenship. So this plan that was approved in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, presents exactly a, a, or wanted to present an holistic approach where uh, led by the security sector uh, entities, but because it should support and uh, 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 intend to uh, guarantee human security was towards citizenship. If I look back and to what I know now, where it struggles is when you call the civil society the civil organizations, local government, and you say, now you lead. And they say, me? It's a security issue. Why do you want me to lead? So sometimes we struggle with that, and sometimes these institutions struggle with that because they fail to understand their role when you start by saying that it's a national plan that wants to improve the country's internal security. But I'll give you uh, another example that I just heard about uh, during the uh, the global counterterrorism uh, focus group that just happened in in uh, Cotonou, Bena. I'm just arriving, and I had the pleasure to listen to the responsible from the Ghana Fusion Center, and we were talking about uh, terrorism counterterrorism. And the Ghana Fusion Center, not only doing what traditionally you would expect uh, a fusion center to, to, to do, uh, was reporting about their latest efforts in strategizing how other entities work with local communities. Their primary perception, human intelligence, humans, so they keep on their role, understanding the importance of having intelligent sources in the ground, but they understand that it's not necessarily intelligent services work only to work with local governments, ethnic groups, leaders, and strategizing, meaning starting with identifying who can do different parts of it, is something that uh, I believe will bring, because it's quite new, will bring them outstanding results in how they will be able to continue leading in the uh, and performing what a fusion center sh is supposed to perform, but probably with a very, very increased capability of receiving information, producing intelligence, and then responding back. Responding back, identifying where radicalization is working. What is being used as the biggest radical radicalization tool? Where are the communities more vulnerable? Why are they more vulnerable? Does it have to do with the mining sector? How are these populations secure or not, safe or unsafe? How is How likely it is to start seeing uh, the mining sector being used because of the access to explosives in being something that could allied with other issues like corruption, uh, uh, a serious fragility to the country's uh, safety and security with regards, for instance, with IEDs and using the access to uh, commercial explosives that are used in mining for other purposes, notably terrorism. These two examples uh, bring me to my other point, which is uh, what a long time now I, we started to call it the security mentality. 
the security mentality is something that we usually uh, and I try to not be too philosophical about it, but it's it's important that we spread it out of the security sector. Our citizens should have a security mentality. Our public servants should have a security mentality. Exactly to understand and to curb the question that I, I, I told you that our local governments were asking us back in my country, what do I have to do with a internal security action plan? This is for you to lead, Minister of Interior, Minister of Justice, but why us? So security mentality is exa exactly uh, something that depends on the education that we are responsible to support. And it shouldn't resume to security leaders, but to all decision makers. And in some way, helping our citizens understand their own role in it. The second, the, the next one has to do with consistency. And that's uh, because we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of ACSS. Consistency is probably for me one of the most frustrating uh, elements, or I should say the lack of consistency. One of the most frustrating elements of my uh, public service career when it comes to uh, policies when we develop strategies and action plans, we have an obligation to not let, or at least to warn, to raise our hands and to inform our decision makers uh, and not let politics change approaches just because there is a need for a, a new flavor. And guess what? I joined the UN and I see it at the international stage as well. We change flavors because International organizations such as the UNLCT, such as the UN, but I would say that ECOWAS, you know, African Union would, would say the same, live through our member states. It's what our member states inform and tells us, and particularly because we depend on financial contributions of member states for programs, we tend to need to change and shift because new flavors, the new perfumes, and that's where the money go, and then we go after, it, and we leave things behind. And there's a maturity process when it comes to policies, particularly in the security sector, but particularly when we're talking about education and capacity building. So uh, plans need to be fully implemented before we can evaluate and conclude what have worked, what didn't work, and what and how to change. I was particularly privileged to work with uh, two different governments after elections. And uh, my first meeting with the new elected prime minister, I gave him a document and I told him, well, just to say, tell you, sir, that this is the same document I had given one year and a half to the former prime minister. And I'm not changing a word in it because nothing happened in these last 18 months that justify the changes. How you will put your policies in place with your, with your own government agenda, that's something different. But just for you to say that in my perspective, when it comes to our national security, things haven't changed. So my priorities to you should be the same. Uh, let me pass now to the second thing they asked me to do in this speech, which is to give some advice uh, to you as emergent security sector leaders. Uh, well, I do not know if I can call these advices because I usually shy away of giving uh, advices uh, to a very diverse audience like you are, uh, coming from some very different regions, countries, institutions, backgrounds, career pathways. So let me call these some food for thought. And I know that in the next two weeks, you'll be discussing these in different ways. So uh, I'm not worried at all. Um, so again, leadership. Leadership implies understanding the existing institutions, 
public and private stakeholders, their role, and which should lead to achieving different outcomes. You need to invest in security partnerships. Authority and legal command will rarely be effective in the long run. And if you want to deal with the deep roots of most of our security challenges we face, you need to establish security partnerships. Know your country, its people particularly, beyond your own reality, uh, social environments or ethnicity. I was in the bus speaking to some uh, uh, colleagues uh, from Cabo Verde and I was telling them that I'm, from an Islander perspective, it's very easy for you to know one of our or two of our 10 islands, I know them all. I know the 10 of them, I was privileged. And pay attention to idiosyncrasies, similitudes, differences. For you and some of your countries, it's way more difficult, but you should try to do it. It's important to understand the reality, the social environment beyond where we grew up. We follow orders, but we can keep our minds free and exercise critical thinking in the security sector. And critical thinking is something that it's probably one of the best things you get from ACSS. Uh, I've been privileged in the past years that I came or I met amazing uh, scholars, but also people with a, a lot of practitioners experience in the security sector uh, of different countries in Africa. And I've learned a lot with the discussions, including with things I didn't agree with. And it's important to learn from the people that you dissent from. Um, you need or you should exercise ethical decision-making in daily practice. Regardless, what is your role, military, law enforcement, intelligence, national security, uh, government, uh, your decision-making process or your contribution for decision-making processes should be reportable in an ethical manner. It means that looking back to something you've done or you contribute for a decision that was taken five years ago, you should be able to tell people, my contribution was based on this and this and this in ethical considerations. Finally, and because I'm also mindful of the time we have allocated, and I kept this one because it's probably something you will come back to, has to do with education. Uh, invest in it, in your own personal education but invest also in your institution as this being something that you need to allocate resources for. I have to say that when I joined the judicial police and the first budget I looked at, training, zero for budget for training, zero. When I question the government, the Ministry of Justice, my predecessor, oh, don't worry, international cooperation usually takes care of that. Uh, so that's why uh, we don't have to allocate funds. That's a huge mistake. And with that said, I'm not saying that we should not, because we should take full advantage of international cooperation in the multilateralism, in bilateral relations to support us. But when we do not allocate resources, we don't value enough. And if we don't value, we don't prioritize, we don't even know what we really need. And I have a couple of stories of our own fault on sometimes needing something and getting something different because you are being given what the person that or the institution has to give you and not exactly what you were needing. And we should understand how important it is for us to set our own path of what we want our institution to know, to learn, to own. And I finish with this, appropriation. 
We need to do the exercise. Usually the military side of the house is much better in doing that than the civilian side of the house. Military academies have a structure. Every now and then there's necessary mandatory training for you to promote in your career. In law enforcement, in a lot of our countries, we lack. And we have people coming. And of course, the Americans come and they, they teach their way. The French come, they teach their way. The Portuguese come, they teach their way. And it's all that you can ask them to do, right? So what is our way? What do we keep? We keep very little. We keep individual learning, but we do not develop institutional capabilities of saying, okay, this we can do, and now, now I want you to help me develop expertise that I don't have in-house. So I'll stop here with the education part of my uh, conversation. I'm happy to be with you for the rest of the of the day. I think we have a chat that probably will bring these and other topics to the to the table. So thank you very much for your attention.